Today we are going to be looking at longitudes and latitudes. And this is a topic under mensuration in mathematics. Now, when you have an object and you want to know the distance from one point of the object to the other, or you want to know the area of the object, or you want to know the volume that the object occupies, you will study this under mensuration. So let's say you have an object, say a rectangle, and you want to know the distance between point A and point B. Or you want to know the area occupied by this object. You want to know the total area occupied by this object. Or if this object is a solid object, if it is a solid object and you want to know the volume of this object, you can study either the area of this object, the volume, or the perimeter. You can do all these studies under mensuration. But now, when you're looking at the earth surface, you're not talking about any other object, you're not talking about a square, you're not talking about a rectangle, you're not talking about a cone. Now you're considering the earth surface. This is the shape of the earth, it's a sphere. The earth is a spherical, uh, the shape is spherical. So when you're talking about calculations, on the earth surface, noting, uh, noting the distances between points on the earth surface, you use longitude and latitude. I hope you get the relationship. And that is why studying longitude and latitude is also classified under mensuration. In most mathematics textbooks, you see it under mensuration too because it is also studying about points on the earth, noting the distance and understanding how to do calculations on the surface of the earth. And that is what we're going to be doing in this course, mensuration for longitudes and latitudes. Now, looking at the shape of the earth, the earth is a spherical object. It is very important that we identify some important uh, points on the earth. So, now when you look at the earth, that very cycle at the middle of the earth, the horizontal cycle, is known as the equator, whereas the vertical cycle is known as the Greenwich Meridian. So these very two points are very, very important and they are known as great circles because if you cut the earth through this very circle, you're going to find two equal parts. So any point, any um, circle around the earth's surface, any circle around the earth's surface through which when you cut the earth, you can get two equal parts. We call them the Great circle, we call them the what? Great circle. And the two major important great circles are the equator and the Greenwich Meridian. And they are going to be used as reference points in the calculations that we're going to be doing under longitudes and latitudes. So, very importantly, take note of these two points the equator, which is the circle through the middle, the horizontal circle through the middle of the earth's surface, and also the Greenwich Meridian, which is the circle through the middle of the air surface also, but this time around, uh, vertical circle. So take note of these two, the equator and the Greenwich Meridian. Though these are not the only two great circles. Most of the, or uh, all the meridians, apart from the Greenwich Meridian, most all of them are all great circles. So what is the objective of this very course that we're going to begin. 
what and what are we expected to know after this course longitude and latitude under menstruation two number one after this course you should be able to distinguish between a great circle and a small circle which is what i've just explained a great circle is that circle that when you cut through you have equal halves of the sphere of the earth like when you cut the earth through this equator you're going to have two equal parts or when you cut it through the greenwich meridian there are plenty other great circles as longitudes but the greenwich meridian and the equator are the two major great circles now number two you're going to be able to identify the longitudes and the latitudes now what are the longitudes and latitudes now the longitudes are those circles if you want to run circles if you want to run circles across the earth's surface you can run as many as you want you can have this you can have this so all the circles that are vertical all the vertical circles like this they are all called longitudes they are called longitudes whereas this other circle that you have like the equator and any other circle you have like this cutting the earth into two places they are known as latitudes so the horizontal circles are the latitudes whereas the vertical circles are the longitudes so take note and like i said the most important latitude is the equator whereas the most important longitude is the greenwich meridian so that's why we noted it here the most important longitude is greenwich meridian the most important latitude is the equator so take note of this you see i just aligned the objectives and already we are solving them so at least we get them to where we start doing calculations which we do in the next class now let's look at the third objective determine and sketch the position of a point now if you have a point on the earth surface if uh, people that if you want to calculate distances on the earth surface like distance from one point on earth to the other distance from nigeria to canada knowledge of longitude and latitude can actually help you so let's say you pick a point here and this point is in nigeria maybe in abuja or anywhere you can if you locate this point you can find the longitude and you can also find the latitude of this point so when you give us the longitude and latitude you are giving us the position of this point so anybody that you tell that this is the position of this very point he can easily locate it now we should also be able to calculate the distance between two points on a great circle and i told us that great circles are those circles that if you cut the earth through them you get a perfect equal size so let's say you cut the earth through this circle you are going to have equal size once you cut the earth through the equator you get two equal parts because the equator is a great circle if you also cut the earth through the greenwich meridian you also get two equal parts if you cut the earth through this so now if you want to calculate the distance between two points on a great circle this is a great circle the equator so let's say you want to calculate the distance between point b and point a so you should be able to find a way of calculating this distance between point b and point a point a and point b so it's part of the things we are going to be learning under longitudes and latitude you should also be able to calculate the distance between two points on the parallel of a latitude so if you also have another latitude here which is a small circle because it's not dividing the earth into two equal parts you can also calculate the distance between c and d so you can always do this calculation 
Now we can also calculate the speed of a point on the S surface due to rotation. So if you want to calculate the speed of a point on the Earth's surface due to rotation, we should also be able to do this calculation under longitude and latitude. So that, that, uh, those are the objectives of this very lecture. You should be able to distinguish between gray circles and small circles. And this objective, we've been able to solve them up to this point. So in subsequent classes, we'll be doing the remaining calculations. So let me go through them again. Number one, distinguish between gray circles and small circles. And I say that a gray circle is any circle through which when you cut the edge, you can have a proper. Let's say you cut the edge through the equator, you'll be having something like this. through the equator you have three four parts but let's say you come to this other latitude and you cut the earth through here what are you going to be having you'll be having something like this so you can see that this one is bigger Whereas this is smaller. So when you cut the, the earth through this very latitude, you are not going to have two equal parts. So this very circle or this very latitude is known as a small circle. Because you cannot get two equal parts of the earth when you cut through them. But the one that through which when you cut, you can get two equal parts like the equator is a gray circle. So that's why gray circles, the latitude that is a gray circle is the equator. Whereas most of the longitudes are gray circles. Because if you cut the earth through these points, you're going to get two equal halves. So the Greenwich Meridian is a gray circle. If you also cut the earth through these other points, you also get two equal parts. If you cut through these points, two equal parts through these points, so you have plenty gray circles as the meridians. Note another word for the longitudes are meridians. So you have plenty of gray circles as longitudes. But the latitude, the gray circle there is the equator because it is through the equator that you can have two equal parts. So whenever you hear the word meridian, you're also talking about longitudes. Now, identify the longitudes and the latitudes. I told us that the vertical cycles across the Earth's surface are known as the longitudes, whereas the horizontal ones are the latitudes. And the most important horizontal or the most important latitude is the equator because it is a reference point for measuring other distances. Whereas the most important longitude is the Greenwich Meridian because it is also the reference point for measuring other points and meridians on the Earth's surface. So that is where we're going to be stopping. And I believe that you've known what great circles and small circles are. And you can as well tell me what longitudes and latitudes are. So in subsequent classes, we'll be able to determine and sketch a point on the Earth's surface calculate the distances between two points. Or oh, please, yeah, if you perfect. like this video, hit the subscribe button by this side of the screen. If you have any questions and concerns, drop them in the comment section. Now you have been the call with the other line. You, what of you, where is your wife? If you want to contact us, you can always use the uh, reference points. Alpha. Alpha for the guy. Thank you. Now, 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 we're at the top now. Why I never get up now? Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be calculating distances along great circles.
So let's think of this problem and see the way we can solve it.
whether it is across the equator or across whether it is along the equator or along the meridians, whether it is along the equator or along the meridians. So whenever you're giving a question like you just look at the positions. This is the same. East east subtract. If it is west west, subtract. If it is east and west, add. If it is west and east, add. The same thing if you're considering it. I didn't even come here, you came here and you saw uh, 9 here and also 9 here. Now you now have here, there's 1 and here you have 2. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to forget about this because this is the same as it. they are constant. That means you're calculating along the meridian. So this is what you're considering. And two of them are not not. So what do you do? You subtract. It will be 31 minus 12. All over 360 times 2 pi r. But had it been you have 12 south, like you have 12 south and 31 north, you have 31 plus 12. All over 360 times 2 pi r. So that is how you go about solving for distances along the rest of it. So once you see the question, Look at it very well, analyze it before you solve it. Now, why did we have to subtract in order to get 23? Now, if you look at this question now, this is the initial diagram that is given. Now, it is being calculated along the equator. So, this equator is a circle on its own. And that is the circle that it's I can over, it's over here, but from the Now, from the middle, you have point K. Okay. From the middle, point K. From the middle, point L. From the middle, point L. From the middle, point G. From the middle, point G. So, this circle is actually the circle of the equator, actually. So, I brought it out to be clear. Now, you're given that the first one, G, K, is 32. Yeah. Which is this one. Oh, I've already cleaned this up. I had zero here. And zero here. So just that I had that. So from here to here is Whereas from here to here is just zero. So what would be this remaining place? You see that it's going to be 32 minus 9. And that's where we have 32 minus 9 here is half 23. So the 23 all over 360 times 2 pi r. Solving down. Gives me this uh, kilometer. So, this is the distance. If I approximate to two significant figures, I get this. So, very well, what we are going to go home with in today's lecture is that once you're given a problem on distances along the red circle, just get to know the difference in the angle. Check the angle where you have the difference. If they are the same uh, direction, you subtract. If they are different directions, you add. So any difference in the angle all over 360 times 2 pi r gives you where r, r here is equal to 6,400. So that is how we go about this. Please, if you like this video, hit the subscribe button by the side of the screen. If you have any questions and concerns, drop them in the comment section. If you want to contact us, check out the description part of this video. Thank you for your listening. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at distances along the parallels of latitude, under longitudes and latitude. Now, how do we solve problems relating to distances along the parallels of latitude? Now, let's take an example so that we can study this. Now, find the distance measured along the parallel of latitude between two points whose latitudes are both 56 degrees north with longitude 23 degree east and 17, 17 degree west respectively. Now, I told us that whenever we have problems of calculating distances in longitudes and latitudes, now, given that the both points, this uh, point and this point, have the same 
latitude. Now we we'll check the longitudes. We we'll check whether the position or the direction are the same. If the directions are the same, like this is west, this is east. So they are not the same. That means you have to add. But if it is west, west, you have to multi uh, subtract. If it is east, east, you have to subtract. But because this is east and this is west, you have to do what's add. And that's why we added the two angles to get this. Now, when we are calculating along gray circles, that is along the equator and the meridians, we say that once you get the difference in the angles, you are doing addition for the one that has different direction, or you are doing a subtraction for the ones that have the same direction. Now, since you are having the one with different directions, you have to add. So once you get that difference in angle, whether you get it, uh, get it by addition or subtraction, just do what the angle is all over 360 times 2 pi r for gray circles. But if you're talking about latitude, parallels of latitudes, instead of having 2 pi r, where r is the big r of sister, uh, uh, sister of 400, you're going to be having this small r. And this small r is the same thing as 2 pi the big r plus the angle of the latitude. So that is the major thing that you need to understand about this calculation. It's still the same thing. Get the difference in angle all over 360 times 2 pi r. But instead of having the big r as in the calculation for uh, great circles, you are now having small r. And the value of this small r is simply 2 pi the big r cos the angle of the last two. So once you fix that, you're going to get this. So that is the main point, and that is the main thing that you're going to be looking at. For. Because in the exam condition, you may not have time to be making all these diagrams. These diagrams actually makes this solution very simple. But if you have, if you're in the exam condition, you might not be drawing to explain all this. This is what you go through. Check out the angles. Provided they are having constant latitude, check out the long, longitudes. If they are having the same direction, if it is east, east, or west, west, subtract. But if it is east and west, or west and east, add them all. Then the angle that you get all over 360 times 2 pi r, if it is for gray circle. But if it is for parallel of latitude, 2 pi small r, where the small r is equal to uh, big r cos. 56 cos the angle of the latitude and that's how you go about it but if you want to look at this critically this is where it is represented these are the two points we have this point and we have this other point this is the r so if you consider this angle cao cao you're going to find out that this small r is equal to this big R cos 56, which is this angle. And that is how we come about this. Now, CAB, CAB is simply the addition of these two angles, giving you 40. So that ARC CB will be equal to 40, which is total of this, all over 360 times 2 pi R. That is the formula for ARC. But this small R, is actually equal to r cos 56. So you, in place of small r, you put r cos 56. So the same formula of the arc, so that you can solve that. You know that 2 pi r is something as saying 2 times 22 over 7 times 6,400 6, to give us this 40,000. So when you multiply out, you'll be able to get this as your answer. And that is how you go about solving this. So very simply, uh, okay. the calculation for parallels of latitude and gray circles, they are very similar. Only that for gray circle, it is, you're using this R in this formula. You're using the big R. Or for latitude, you're using small R. But noting that this small R is equal to big R cos the angle of the latitude.
So that is where we're going to be stopping today. Please, if you like this video, hit the subscribe button by this side of the screen. If you have any questions or concerns, drop it on the comment section. If you want to contact us, check the description part of this video. Thank you and God bless you. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at calculus. Calculus is a very important mathematics that you have to learn if you are to be writing mathematics in jam. When you're in uh, 100 level in the university, you're also supposed to do some things in calculus. Whenever you hear the word calculus, you think about differentiation and integration. What kind of mathematics do we need calculus to solve? Whenever you have expressions or mathematical situations where you have changes, like you have changing velocity, changing acceleration, changing size or container, then you use what we call calculus. And in using calculus, you use the tools in calculus, the limits, differentiation, and integration. So in this our course in calculus, we are going to be covering limits differentiation and integration. These three aspects that we are covering on that calculus, they are linked together, they are related. From limits, we get to differentiation, and we all know that integration is the opposite of differentiation. So, in our time in this course, we'll be looking at these three limits, differentiation, and integration. So whenever you hear about calculus, we are talking about changes and how to take care of changes mathematically. And this calculus involves limits, differentiation, and integration. So as a matter of getting down the note, uh, we are going to be looking at calculus. And under calculus, we are going to be looking at limits. We are going to be looking at differentiation and we are going to be looking at integration. Now, mathematically, integration is the opposite of differentiation. When you integrate, you get back to where you were before, before the differentiation was made to an expression. So we look at this expression. Given this very expression, if you differentiate this expression, you have this. Now, if you integrate this very expression, you have this, which is actually where you're coming from. So when you differentiate an expression, you have a different expression. But when you integrate, you get back to where you started from. Using, uh, you can differentiate using this formula. So in subsequent classes, we are going to be learning how we arrive at getting from here to here, differentiating, and also getting from here to here, integrating. So you're going to be given a simple expression like this in JAM or in, or in your further mathematics and way, and you're going to ask what is the derivative of this. So when you ask that question, what is the derivative of this expression, it simply means differentiate this and when you differentiate this you get this and this is the simple uh, explanation of this anything that you have up here take it back here so that you now have x a n then anything that is up here reduce it by one so that is what was done here when you take this over to this side it becomes three times two which is six then anything here reduce it by one you have three minus one which is two so that's how you come about this so with this expression or with this formula, you can always differentiate. So we differentiated this to get this. Then when you integrate this derivative, you get back this expression. So if you integrate this, you get back this. 
So in subsequent classes, I'm going to be showing us how to integrate, how to differentiate, and the derivatives of some very, very important uh, expressions like cos theta or cos x. How do we differentiate cos x? Cos x equal to sine x as the derivative. Then how do we differentiate sine x? Sine x equal to minus cos x. So all these major derivatives, x and all of them, all these major derivatives, we're going to be looking at them. We're going to be getting their derivatives and uh, their integrals as well. So if you are told to find, when you work on this, you get this as the integral. So you have derivative, you have integral. So differentiate to get the derivative, then integrate to get the integral. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, and I told us before, calculus has to do with whenever we have changes. Very, very important. It's the kind of mathematics that helps you to solve problems that involves changes. Let's say you have a car. And this car is moving at uh, 30 kilometers per hour. You understand? So, what uh, distance will it cover in three hours? So, you're going to have the distance covered will be 30 times 3. So, if this car is actually moving on a freeway, but let's take, for instance, this car is actually moving, but some other things are blocking it. You have other bigger cars or smaller cars that are in front. So this car cannot actually move at a constant speed of 30 kilometers per hour. So provided that it cannot move at this constant speed, sometimes it will move at 20 kilometers per hour. Sometimes it will move at uh, maybe 10 kilometers per hour. It's changing. The speed is changing. So how do you now calculate the distance when it has changing speed? Will the distance still be speed times time? So how do you take care of this change? Because the speed is no longer constant. So you can use derivatives, you can use integrals. So you can actually use calculus to solve this problem. So any mathematical problem that involves changes, you can use calculus to solve. So before we go deeper into how to use these techniques to solve, then you understand how to apply them in problems like this. So we're going to be looking at limits, we're going to be looking at differentiation, we're going to be looking at integration, all in calculus. So one thing to take out of this today's course is that whenever you have a mathematical problem that involves changes like acceleration, changing acceleration, changing velocity, even in physics and in engineering, you're going to be coming across calculus, you're going to be coming across ordinary differential equations and the rest of it. So we're going to be looking at these in details. Uh, please hit the subscribe button so that anytime we release our videos, you'll be the first to get them. Thank you. God bless you. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at arithmetic progression. We're going to be looking at what? Arithmetic prog progression. We call it AP. We call it what? AP. We said that a sequence is a succession of terms. You understand? In which the difference between either of the terms, uh, the first and the second, or the successive terms, is governed by a rule, isn't it? So a special type of this sequence is known as arithmetic word progression. We have the difference, we call it common difference. Call it what? Common difference. And the first time is represented with the letter word A. The difference between successive terms is known as the word common word difference, represented with the letter word D. Is that clear? And you can find the nth term by saying Tn equal to what? A, which is the first term, plus bracket N minus 1, close bracket D, common difference. Is that good? So we say arithmetic progression, AP also, can also be called what? Linear sequence. Is a sequence in which the increase or decrease between any two consecutive terms is the same throughout. 
The difference between this and this is the same as the difference between this and this, and this, the same as the difference between this and this. And that difference is known as what? Common difference and it's six. Can you see that? Five plus six, 11. 11 plus six, 17. 17 plus six, 23. 23 plus six, 29. Common difference. We are going to see that this differs from what we have when we are learning GP. Is that clear? What's the common difference for this sequence? 24 minus 9, 15. 15 minus 9, 6. 6 minus 9, minus 3. Minus 3 minus 9, minus 4. Is that clear? Now, the increase or decrease is called the common difference. And it can be positive or what? Negative. The first term of an AP, A, is represented with the alphabet word A. Can you see that? The first term of this arithmetic progression is what? 5. The first term of this one is what? 24. The common difference, which is the difference between consecutive terms, is known as common difference. Is that clear? Represented with what? D. What is the common difference for this sequence? 6. What is that for this? Minus 9. Now, it will be important to calculate the nth term of an AP. And the formula is what? Tn, which is the nth term, is equal to the first term, A, plus the term you are looking for, N, minus 1, all multiplied by what? Common difference. Is that clear? And also, very important, another very important formula is the sum of the terms of AP, gotten by Sn, equal to N over 2, or in block bracket, 2A plus, in bracket, N minus 1, multiply by t. And if you know the last term, you use the formula Sn equal to n over 2, bracket a plus l, close bracket, where l is the word last term. Is that clear? And with that, you can solve this problem. The 16th term of an AP is 93. Given that each common difference is 6, find the first and 28 terms. Can we solve this? Plus, can we solve this? So I'm going to just take this out. So that we solve this. So that we do what? Now, having taken this out, what are the given? Who can tell me the given? We are, we are given the 16th term, is it not? So we say T what? 16. And it can be represented by using this formula. A plus what? N minus 1 D. And this 16th term is equal to what? 93. Can we see this? This is given, isn't it? So if we impute our, our, our values, we have A is what? What's the first term? Not given. So you write A the way it is. Plus N. What is N? 16 minus 1. What is D? Common difference is 6. It's also given, isn't it? Equal to 93. Is that clear? So since there is equal to here, we can remove this because 16 term is already equal to 93. Is that? So we have now a plus what? Well, 16 minus 1, 15 times what? 6 equal to what? 93. You can give me, give me 15 minus times 6? 90. So we have what? a plus 90 equal to what? 93. So that a is equal to 93 minus 93, which is equal to what? So that is the first time, and that's what we are asked to find. First time is that? But we also found asked to find 28 times. So t what? 28 is equal to a. What is a now? 5 plus n is what? 28 minus 1 times common difference 6. Hmm? a is 3. Thank you. Because that's what we found here, isn't it? So we now have 3 plus 28 minus 1. 27 times what? 6. So who can tell me what is 27 times 6? 162 plus what? 3 which will give us 165, and that is what T28. Is that clear? That is how to solve it. In subsequent classes, we'll be looking at GP and other things. Thank you, God bless you. Like our videos, like, subscribe to our channel. Hello, welcome. Uh, we are looking at geometry, and we say that geometry is that aspect of mathematics that deals with what? Shapes. 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 That deals with what? Shapes. Shapes. Exactly. And the difference between these shapes is due to the angles that the lines are making with each other. Is that clear? Yes. So today we are going to be looking at angles. We are going to be looking at what? Angles. What is an angle? 
An angle is that change in direction, that clear, or distance between two lines. You understand? Or that is sustained when two lines are diverging from one another. Is that clear? Let's say this one of my hand is an angle. Can you see this? Let's say this is a line surface, a line. Hmm? This is another line. And they are meeting at a point. This distance from here to this other part is known as the what? Angle. Is that clear? So let's say this is the line. Are you seeing this line? Are you seeing another line? Both of them are meeting at a what? Point. They are meeting at a what? Point. point. So let's say they are together. Now they are diverging. Is that clear? This distance here is known as what? Angle. It's known as angle and it's measured in what? Degrees. Let's say that it is uh, 33 or 46. It's measured in what? Degrees. That's why we say that an angle or angles are the distance, distance between this line and this line. Distance or change in direction between two line surfaces. Can you see the two line surfaces? Diverging from the same point. They are diverging from the same what? Point. point. Measured in what? Degrees. Is that clear? That is what an angle is. And we have different kinds of angle, different types. We have what we call right angle, right angle. We have straight angle. We have obtuse angle. We have reflex. reflex angle, depending on the size of the angle. Is that clear? So these angle types are actually dependent on the word size, depending on the word size. Now, the right angle is the angle that has the size of what? 90, 90 degrees. degrees. Or you can call it the quarter of a what? Revolution. Why do you call it the quarter of a revolution? Because if you have a cycle like this, and you divide the cycle into what? Four. One of them is always making an angle of what? 90 degrees. So that is this angle. Can you see that? It's always 90 degrees. Straight angle is the angle that has the size of what? 180. Can you see that this is straight? 90 plus what? 90. Making it what? 180. And that is this. You have acute angle is what? Any angle that is less than a what? Right, right angle. angle. Can you see that this is right, less than that right angle? It's less than 90. Obtuse angle is any angle that is greater than what? 90, but actually less than what? 180. It's greater than a right angle, but it's less than a what? Straight angle. Reflex angle is the angle that is greater than 180, but less than what? 360. Can you see that? Can you see this angle? It's bigger than 180, isn't it? But yes. it's less than 360, which is a full revolution. Now we'll talk about complementary angle. Complementary angle, two angles are said to be complementary if the sum of those two angles is what? 90. Can you see these two angles? This is 90 degrees, right angle, isn't it? Then you have an angle here, A, plus another angle here, B. When you add these two, what will you get? 90. So we call these two angles. Say that both of them are what? Complementary. Both of them are what? Complementary. Two angles are said to be complementary if the sum or the addition of both of the angles gives what? 180. That's mm -hmm. it. Now, supplementary angle. Two angles are said to be supplementary if their sum is equal to what? 180. Can you see that? This is 180, is it not? Straight angle. Now, you have angle C plus angle D giving you 180. So, angle C and D are said to be what? 180. They are said to be what? 180. No, no. They are said to be what? Supplementary. Angle A and what? Angle C and angle and D are what? Supplementary. Supplementary. Why? Because the addition of both of them gives you what? 180. Is that clear? So these are the these are the kinds or types of angles that we have in geometry. Is that clear? Subsequent classes we are going to be looking at other things in geometry. Please, if you like this our video, click on the subscribe button. Share this our video so that other people can see. Thank you so much for this. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at plane mensuration. Today we're going to be looking at what? Plane mensuration. Plane mensuration is simply that aspect of mathematics that deals with finding a way of determining the perimeter 
and the area of friendships. Start clear. In plain mensuration, we try to determine the what perimeter and what area of friendships, or you can say determining the circumference of a circle. Is that clear? Perimeter or area of friendships, and we know what friendships are, isn't it? The shape that don't have depth. Example is what triangle, trapezium, parallelogram, square, square, rectangle, isn't it? So today we're going to be starting with that of a triangle. I would say that perimeter is the distance round a plane shape. Is that clear? Are you seeing this plane shape? What is the distance round it? This side plus this side plus this side. Is that not? That is the distance. So if you are told to calculate the perimeter of this triangle, it's simply A plus B plus what? C. Can you see perimeter equals to A plus B plus C? And we are giving the values of A, B to C as 8, 10, and 15. So we have 8 plus 15 plus 10, giving us 10. Is that clear? Now let's look at the area of a triangle. Area is the space, this physical space. Is that clear? Let me indicate. This is the perimeter, this side, this and this. Whereas area is the space that is this triangle is actually occupying. Is that clear? So how do we calculate it? We use if we are given these three sides, like A, B, and C, you use what we call Hero's formula. You use what we call what? And it states that area is simply the root of x bracket x minus a bracket x minus b bracket x minus c. We have a, b, c are the sides. Is that clear? And this s can be gotten by saying half of the summation of the sides. Is that clear? That is when a, b, and c, the sides are given. That's the formula you use in evaluating the area. But now, when you are giving one side, say A, you are giving only A, and you are also giving this a perpendicular height on that A, what formula are you going to use? You are going to use that area is equal to half the side given A and the height of the perpendicular line that gets to the A. Is that clear? So you say half of the product of the side and the perpendicular height to it. But then, when you are giving two sides, let's say you are giving a and, a and C, or C and B, or A and B, what formula are you going to use? We're going to use this formula that says area is equal to half A, B, sine C. You understand? So if you are giving A and C, you say half A, C, sine what? B. Sine what? A and C. A, C, sine B. The angle that is in between them. Is that clear? If you are giving A and B, you say half a, B, sine what? C. The angle between A and C. Is that clear? Or the angle facing the opposite side that you are not giving. That's the formula. So you either, any one that you are giving, just know that you are saying half the product of the two sides given times the angle that is faced, that is in between them or the angle of the side that is not given. That is, that the angle opposite the side that is not given. Is that clear? So you check that. So you can either use any of these formulas, three formulas of area, depending on what you are giving. If you are giving the three sides, you use area is equal to root of x bracket, x minus a bracket, x minus b bracket, x minus c. Here s is equal to half of the summation of the sides. If you are giving a side and a perpendicular height to it, use area equal to half that side and times the perpendicular height to it. If you are giving two sides with angle in between them, you use half the product of the two sides times the angle, sine times sine of the angle in between them. Is that clear? Yes. So those are the formulas you can use in solving for the areas of the circle. Yes, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button. Share our video so that you can see the Thanks for your support. God bless you. Yes, welcome. Today we're going to be continuing in our lectures on plane mensuration. On what? Plane mensuration. We say that plane mensuration is what we try to determine the parameters and areas of plane shapes. That way. And in the previous classes, we looked at uh, triangles. Today we're going to be looking at other shapes like the parallelogram, the 
trapezium and the kite and the what? Cycle. Exactly. Yeah. Square regular is the shape of the four opposite sides. Exactly. Mm -hmm. If this is A, you also know that this is also A. The opposite is A. If this is B, also know that the opposite is what? B. And the perimeter is simply, you know what a perimeter is. The length around the shape, isn't it? So it's going to be A plus B plus another A plus another B, isn't it? So we have A plus A plus B plus B. So it is collect like that. 2A plus 2B. Now what is the area? The area is simply the base times what? Perpendicular height. What is the base here? The base. You understand? The base times the what? Perpendicular height. That is what the area is. Then you can also find it by saying the two sides. A, B, sine. The what? A, B, sine. They included them in the So we have A, B times what? Sine of the included angle in the That can. So that's the, another way of solving it. So base times perpendicular distance. If the base is A, use A. If the base is B, use what? B here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Then trapezium, the two opposite sides are not equal in the trapezium. Is that clear? Yeah. But the perimeter, like you all already know, is the summation of the sides, which is what? B plus B plus C plus A. Is that clear? Yeah. Whereas the area is what? Half yeah. sum of the what? Parallels. Yeah. Which ones are parallel? A and what? Yeah. B. So sum of the half of the parallel times what? Height. So the height that is subtended, can you see the height here? Yeah. So that is what gives you the area. Or you can say, have some of the parallel lines, C, which is the opposite, times the what? Angle that the C subtends with the base. Is that clear? Yeah. Then a kite is a shape that has these two sides equal and these other sides equal. So that the perimeter will simply be this plus this plus this plus this. Which will give us what? 2a plus 2b. Is that clear? Yes, sir. If you factor 2 out, we have 2 in brackets, a plus b. And the area is simply area of the triangle ABC. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Plus area of triangle what? Where is triangle ABC? This is the smaller a, part. C, the smaller part, isn't it? Then plus area of the bigger part, isn't it? Yes. B, C, D. So when you add it together, you get the total area. Now we look at a circle. Circle, the perimeter is also called the what? Circumference. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. And it's simply what? 2 pi r. And we know that 2r is the same thing as d. Yeah. This is r, is it not? Yeah. This is the radius. What is d? Diameter. Diameter. Or real d. You understand? So d is equal to what? 2r. So if you remove 2r and place with d, you have just pi d, is it not? Yeah. That is the parameter or circumference of a cycle. I will also have that the area of a cycle is what? Pi r, r squared. Square. Is that clear? Yes. And these are the various plane shapes and their formulas of their areas and what? Parameters. Is that clear? Very, very important. You need to take note of these formulas because in your jump and wire, you'll be using them much, much more. In subsequent classes, we are going to be taking examples on all these. Exactly. If you like this video, please click on the subscribe button. Thanks for your support. Thank you very much. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at series. Series is uh, very similar to the sequence that we looked at. You understand? In the sequence we looked at, we separated the numbers with commas. Separated the numbers with what? Commas. And now we're going to be separating the numbers that are in the series with addition sign. Is that clear? So it's just very similar. Here we have a series is the addition of the terms of the what? The sequence. Given the sequence 3 over 2, 3 and 6, these are the sequence we generated in the last class. Is it not? Yes. If you want to represent them in form of series, you simply say 3 over 2 plus 3 plus 6. Is that clear? Yes. This is another series. 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9 plus 11. Who can tell me how these numbers are coming? 3 plus 2 is what? 5. 5 plus 2? 7. 7 plus 2? 9. 9 plus 2? 11. So that's a series, is it? 
whenever you have plus sign. Now, you find the series of the first six terms of 2 to the power n plus 4n. This is the rule, isn't it? Yes. So, we simply say that the n is equal to 2 to the power n plus 4n squared. That? Yes. So, to find the first term, you replace everywhere you see n, you replace it with what? 1, because you're finding the first term. So, find the second term anywhere you see n, you replace it with what? 2. So, to find the first term, you simply say 2 to the power 1, this is 2, plus 4. 1 to the power 2 is 1. 1 times 4, 4. 4 plus 2, 6. Is that clear? Yes. Term 2, 2 to the power 3, 2, 4. 4 times 4, 16. 16 plus 4, 20. Term 3, 3 to the power 2, 9, 9. 9 times 4, Press your calculator. 9 times 4 is what? 36. 36. Plus 2 to the power 3 is 8. 36 plus 8 is 44. Is that clear? Yes. So that's how you got all the terms. Up to what? 6 terms. Up to what? 6 terms. Can you see? 6. Yes. So to find the series, simply add up the terms. 6 terms. The first term is 6. The second term is what? 20. The third term is what? 44. The fourth term? 18. The fifth term? The system. So whenever you have them in, doesn't it necessarily mean that you should add them and find the addition. Just in this arrangement, it's all a series. Exactly. Okay. So you're going to do that for the rest of the one that we've done and the one in your assignment. Stop pressing your phone. Okay. Finish the assignment before you start pressing. Thank you. Yeah. Please, if you like this, uh, click on the subscribe button, like and share the video. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at sequence and series. Today we are going to be looking at what? Sequence and series. Sequence and series. We will also be looking at APs and GPs. We will be looking at what? APs and GPs. Arithmetic progression and what? Geometric progression. What do we understand by the term sequence? Sequence, sequence of numbers. You can tell me what is sequence. Can you tell me what? A sequence is a succession of numbers. A what? Succession of numbers. Or you can call it succession of terms that obey a well defined rule. That obey what? A well defined rule. Example is when we have something like this. If we have one, two, three, four, five, six. This is a sequence, is that clear? Yeah. Of integers. And the rule is simply the addition of one. The rule is what? Addition of one. To successive numbers, is that clear? Yes. One plus one is what? Two. Two plus one? Three. Three plus one? Four. Four plus one? Five. Five plus one? Six. Is that clear? Yes, five. The rule is what? Addition of what? One. You understand? Yes. This is sequence of numbers. Obeying the simple rule of adding what? One. one. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So you can say that a sequence is a succession of terms such that the terms are related to one another according to a well defined what? Rule. Well defined what? Rule. Rule. You understand? So the rule is actually what will help you to predict the next number. Is that clear? Yes. So if we have six here, can you predict the next number? What is it? Seven. 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 Because you are just adding what? One. one. Now let's take examples. If we have five, eleven, seventeen, twenty-three, what will be the next number? To get the next number, you need to know the rule that the, the, the sequence is obeying. Is that clear? Yes. And the rule is what? Multiply set of positive integers by what? Six. 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 And subtract by one. So let's see how one, five was gotten. Sets of integers, we start with 1, isn't it? Yes. Multiply it by what? 6. six. And subtract what? 1. 1 times 6? Six. 6. 6 minus 1? 5. Can you see? That's how this 5 was gotten. Now, 11, how did we get it? The next number is what? 2, two times, times six. what? 6 minus, minus one. 1. 2 times 6? 12. Minus 1. 11. Can you see that? Yes. Then the next number will be what? 3 times 6. 3 times times 6 minus, minus one. 1. 3 times 6 is what? 
minus one seventeen. See, that's how we are creating this sequence by obeying this rule. By obeying this word, and the rule simply say multiply set of positive integers by what and subtract by six. So those positive integers are one, two, three down. You understand? So whenever you multiply them by six and subtract one from it, you get this sequence. Is that clear? Now we have another sequence. This sequence, the name is, the sequence is what? 1, 3, 9, 27, 81. And the rule is 3 to power n minus 1. Is that clear? So how did we get 1? By simply saying 3 to power 1 minus 1. 3 to power 1 minus 1 is the same thing. 3 to power 0, which is what? 1. That's how we got this one. How did we get this? The second one, 3 to power 2 minus 1. 3 to the power 2 minus 1 is the same thing as 3, 3 to the power 1, one which is what? 3. 3. How do we get this one? We also say 3 to the power what? 3 minus 1. 3 to the power 3, 3 to the power 2 equal to what? 9. 9. That's how we got 9. Exactly. Yeah. How do we get 27? 3 to the power 4 minus 1, which is what? 3 to the power 3, which is what? 27. Exactly. Yes, so once we obey this rule by incrementing this thing from 1 up, we'll be getting all this sequence. Is that clear? Yes, so that is what we call sequence. Any subsection of numbers or terms that obey a defined word rule. Is that clear? So all this is based on rules. The nth term of a sequence is represented by Tn. It's represented by what? Tn. And that represents also the rule. Whereas the other first, second, and third terms are represented by what? T1, T2, T3. So example, we have this example. The nth term of a sequence is given by 3 times 2 to the power n minus 2. Write down the first three terms of the sequence. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So this is Tn as was given 3 times 2 to the power n minus 2. So what would be T1, which is the first term? It will now be 3 times 2 to the power in place of n, you put what? And you solve down to get this. T2 in place of n, you put what? T3 in place of n, you put what? 3. So here, when we have 1 minus 2 is what? Minus, minus one. 1. And for in this, is anyone that has negative exponent, you bring it down, put the other one up. That's 3 over 2. Here you have 2 minus 2 is what? 0. Anything to power 0 is 1. 3 times 1. 3. 3 minus 2, 1. 2 to power 1, 2. 2 times 3. And so on, you understand? Yes, so if somebody tells you to find the T10, the tenth, the tenth term, it will be equal to what? 3 times, times 2 to the power 10 minus 2, which will give us 3 times 2 to the power 8. What did he give you? 768. So that is how you do sequence. Is that it? So sequence always obey a given word. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at set theory. We're going to be looking at set theory. What is a set? A set is a well-defined collection of objects or things. A collection of objects or things. You can talk about a set like you say a set of whole numbers from 2 to 10. That means 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So the elements of the set of a whole number from 2 to 10 are 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, we separate them with commas. So a set is a defined collection of things or numbers. A set of a whole numbers from 2 to 10, this is how you express a set. So A here is a set, this A is a set, and it's, it's more, the, the collection must be contained in a coily bracket. These are the elements of this set A. So the elements of set A are 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, separated with commas. So this is an example of set representation. 
pig. And also represent a set in this one. Pig. The set is always represented in a capital letter. P is equal to set of. Whenever you see curly brackets, it means set. Set of prime numbers from 1 to 20. So in that case, you can still represent this set showing the prime numbers itself or in a statement form like this. Just the same way you can put this one and represent this as set of what? Whole numbers from 2 to 10. So it can be in statement form or it can be in the real form like this. So this is how you represent a set. You write a capital letter representing the name of the set. Then you put the elements, the collection of objects inside the coily bracket separated by commas. That's why we say that a set is a defined collection. You see, it's not one thing, but collection of objects or things. It can be numbers, it can be alphabets, it can be anything. Now, the elements of a set are the items contained in a set. You can see the items that are contained in this set. These are the elements of set A. And it can be represented with this type of E, while a non-element is represented with these. So consider these two sets, sets R and set Q. The elements of set R are 1, 2, 3, 4, to 8, whereas the elements of Q are 9, 11, 12, 13, 14. You can write that 2 is an element of R. You can see the way we represented the two elements of R, because 2 can be found in R. And you can say that 4 is not an element of Q, because if you check through this collection, you cannot see 4. Cardinal number of a set is the number of elements in a set. So if you come, say this set B, having this collection 2, 4, 6, 8, you can say that the cardinal of this set B is 4 because the number of elements are 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. So cardinal of B is equal to 4. C, you can also get the cardinal of C by counting the number of elements. If you count, you are going to have 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It's actually 9. But then F is repeated twice. So any one that is repeated, you don't count, you count it as 1. So you only have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the cardinal of C, the cardinal of set C is 8. A subset is a set within another set. A subset is a set within another set. So consider these two sets. This is set G con containing 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And another set H containing 5, 7, and 8. You can see that this 5, 7, 8 is also here, 5, 7, 8. So you can say that this H is a subset of G. H is a subset of G. And you can represent it using this. H is a subset of G. The bigger side is representing the superset, whereas the smaller side is representing the subset. Now, every set is a subset of itself. Every set is a subset of itself. Let's explain this. Every set is a subset of itself. So let's talk about this set. With that, it brings us to another point known as power of a set. Every set is a subset of itself. Say set B to be this, 1 and 3. What are the subsets of this? Subset is any set that is contained in a set. So we can say that the subset of B are itself. This is a subset of B. Also, subset 1 is also a subset of this because it is contained here. Also, three is also a subset. And finally, empty set is also a subset. So whenever you are drawing, whenever you want to get the subset of a of a given set, this set, these are the subsets. You have one three, which is because we say that every set is a subset of itself. Then we we'll have only one. We we'll have only three. Then we we'll have empty set. So B is actually having how many subsets? having four. So given any set, the number of subsets is known as the power of the set. It's known as the what? Power of the set. 
So how do you know the number of subsets for this? You simply count the number of elements that you have. Just do 2 to power. 2 to power a number of elements. So this is going to have 4 subsets. So let's say that you are giving 1, 3, 4. And you are told to find the subsets. Without writing them one by one. Just say 2 to power 3. Because you have how many elements? 1, 2, 3. So it's going to have how many subsets? 6. So how do we identify these subsets? Once you already know that the subsets will always be 6. It's easier for you to write. So you can always know that every element is a subset of itself. So you have to write this first. Then you have to write only 1. Then you have to write only 3. Then you have to write only 4. That's how many? 1, 2, 3, 4. Then you have to write only uh, 1 and 3. Then you have to write only 1 and 4. Then you have to write empty set. So making it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Mm -hmm. Am I making a mistake? Where is the mistake? 2 to power 3 is what? It's not 6. That's where the mistake is. 2 to power 3 is 8. You understand? Yes. So this has to have up to 8 subsets. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So it's remaining 1. So we need to also have the subset of what? 3 and what? 4. So these are the subsets. You understand? It must have 8 because we have 1, 2, 3. It's going to be 2 to power n, which is 2 to power 3. So let's say now that we have 4 and 5, and we are told to find the power of this set. It's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's going to be 2 to power 4, which is what? 32 mark. So if you build the subsets of this, you're going to get up to 32. 2 to power 4 is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. 2 times 2, 4, 4 times 2, 8. 8 times 2, 16. Sorry. So this should be 16. So if you build the subsets of this, you are going to get up to 16 subsets. So very important, take note. So that is how you get the power of the set. The power of the set is simply telling us the number of subsets that a set has. So all these are subsets of this because all these are contained inside B. 1, 2, 3 is already there. Okay, this is the one I was using. 1, 3, 4 is already there. 1 alone is already here, 3 alone is already here, 4 alone is already here, 1, 3 is already here, 1, 4 is already here. Empty set is the subset of every set, 3, 4 is already here. Every set is a subset of itself. So that is set theory. Make sure you understand, every set is represented with a capital letter, and it was the contents or the collection must be enclosed in a curly bracket, and the elements must be separated with commas. These are the elements. And subset of an element is, an, is another, subset of a set is another set that contains the same element or that contains elements that are inside the main set. So this is the superset and this is the, these are the subset. Power of a set is simply gotten by saying 2 to power the number of elements of the set. And the power of the set is also telling us the number of subsets that a set will have. The power of a set is telling us the number of subsets that a set will have. If you like this our video, please click on the subscribe button. Like and share it. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at algebraic notation of sets. And we'll also be looking at the different types of sets, where we have empty sets. Empty set is any set that does not have any element. Empty set. Finite set. Finite set is any set that the elements can be counted. Infinite set is any element that is set, uh, element, any set that the elements cannot be counted. Now we also have the joint sets. Sets with elements that are not the same. 
Then we also have equal sets, sets that have elements that are the same. So we'll be looking at all these today. Number one is our algebraic set notation. If you look at these two sets, Q is a set of X, so that X is prime numbers less than 25. And Q is a set of 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23. These two sets are the same. This set Q and this other set Q, both of them are the same. Only that the first one is written in algebraic set notation, whereas the second one is written explicitly. Is that clear? I mean, is that clear? David, is that clear? What is the difference between these two sets? Good. This one is written in set notation, whereas this one is written explicitly. So we say this is when elements of the set are not explicitly written. So whenever you don't write them explicitly, you write them in what you call as very what set notation. Exactly. And look at the way it is read. Q is set of X, so that X is a prime is prime number less than 25. And you can see that all the prime numbers that are less than 25 are 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23. So in subsequent classes, I'll be giving you an assignment. I'll write in a bright set notation, and I will require you to write it in the explicit form. You understand? Now, check out this second one. F is a set of x, so that x is a member of integer. And this integer ranges from 5 to 14, with 5 and 14 inclusive. Is that clear? You see, the representation is all the integers from 5 to what, 14. And you know integers are whole numbers, isn't it? So we have 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Why is it that 5 and 14 are included? Because we have less than, uh, we have equal to sign. If there was no this equal to, if it's just less than less than, we would have had from 6 to 13. Is that clear? But whenever you have equal to, it means that the extremes are included. You understand? Between 5 to what? 14. Is that clear? So this is what we call algebraic set notation, and this is the explicit form of writing the sets. You understand? So these two sets are equal. These two sets are the same thing. Only that one is written in algebraic set notation, and the other one is written explicitly. Exactly. Now we look at the types of sets. An empty set is a set without any element. An empty set is a what? Any set that does not have any element. This is a, this is how you say this is an empty set. Is that clear? What's the difference between this set and this set? This other set, this is not an empty set because it has element what? Zero. This is what we call empty set. Set without anything. Another word for empty set is null set. Another word for empty set is what? Null set. Final set. Final set is any set that has elements that can be counted. Is that clear? Final set. Any set that has elements that can be counted. Like Set of local governments in Nigeria. How many local governments do we have in Nigeria? 774, is it not? So it can be counted. So it's a finite set. Give me another finite set. Number of people in this class, you can count yourself, isn't it? But if I say set of odd numbers, is it finite? There are plenty of odd numbers you cannot count. So any set, any ele elements of set, any set that has elements that cannot be counted is known as a finite set. Like set of odd numbers, set of multiples of nine. This joint set, when you have two sets and they have no elements in common, we call them this joint set. Is that clear? Example, set R has element A, L, N, and set Q has element R, K, D. Is there any set in common? Is there any element in common between these two? So this is these are this joint set. Equal sets are sets that contain the same members or elements even if they are not written in the same order. Can you see set C? What are the elements of set C? 1, 3, 4, 7. What are the elements of set B? 3, 7, 1, 4. They, why are they equal? They are equal because they contain the same elements. Can you see? There's 3 here, there's 3 here, there's 1 here, there's 1 here, there's 4 here, there's 4 here, there's 7 here, there's 7 here. But they are not arranged similarly, you understand? But they are still equal. So you can write as C is equal to B. Exactly. So I'm going to be giving out this exercise in set notation to see how we how we are able to understand set notation, set or the break notation. Is that clear? 
So we're going to be doing some examples. Now I'm going to require you to list the elements of the following set. Prime numbers less than 30. List me the elements of this set. Prime numbers less than 30. That's assignment number one. Number two, factors of 24 greater than 3. List me factors of 24 greater than 3. So list it explicitly. And finally, R is element of S so that S R is element of S so that X is a member of N is a member of N and is between and 20 so what question are you supposed to ask me about N you are supposed to know what N stands for who can tell me what N stands for All right, let me just say Z the one I have told you already so that later I will tell you what n is. So we present it such as x, please put s here. So give me this set uh, explicitly. In subsequent classes, we'll look at them. Please, if you like this our video, click on the subscribe button, like and share it. Thank you, God bless. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at the different relationships between sets. Different relationship between mostly two sets or any number of sets. Number one, we are going to be looking at intersection of sets. When you have set A containing elements like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and you have set B containing elements like 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, the intersection of set A and set B is simply the elements that are common to both A and B, which is 3, 4, 5. Intersection of sets is represented as A, this is set A, intersecting set B. It's a set that contains all elements common to set A and B. Example, when you have set A containing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and you have set B containing 9, 6, 4, 8, 10, 12, then Set of A intersection set B will be 4 and 6 because 4 is in A and 4 is in B. 6 is in A and 6 is in B. That's why the intersection is only these two elements that they have in common. Number two, we look at union of sets represented as A, U, B. Set A, union of set B is simply the set that contains all elements set A and B without repeating. So if you have set A as A, B, C, D, E, e and you have set B as e, A, E, I, O, U, then set A union B simply, you write out all the sets. A, B, C, D, E, you continue here. A, but you already written A, so you leave it, don't repeat it. E, you already written E. E here, don't repeat it. I, you write I. O, you write O. U, you, you write U. So it's simply the collection of both sets here and here. But don't repeat without what? Repeating. That is A union B. Now, universal set. Universal set is represented with U or E, capital letter U or E. And it's actually the background set. You understand? 
that contains all the sets that you're considering at the moment. Like say you're considering this set M that contains one, three, five, seven, eight. And you're also considering set N that contains one, two, four, six, eight. What is the universal set? Universal set is simply like a union set of these two. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Combination of all the possible sets. When you combine them, you form this. So that you cannot talk about complement of sets, which is complements of sets is actually the elements that are not in the sets that you're considering, but are actually in the universal set. So let's say complement is written, you represent it by prime or small c at the top. So complement of set M, this is set M, 1, 3, 5, 7, 8. What are the complements? Complements of set M are those elements that are in the universal set, but they are not here. Like here you have 1, but you don't have 2. Because you don't have 2 in M, we put it here. You don't have 4 in M, we put it here. You don't have 6 in M, put it here. So those sets that you don't have in M, but you have them in the universal set, they are the complements of M. The same thing, what are the complements of N? Those sets that are not in those sets that are not in N, but they are in universal sets. Like here, one is here, so you don't one is not. There is three here, but there is no three here, so you write. There is five here, but there is no five here, you write. There is seven here, but there is no seven here, you write. So complements of N are those sets that are in the universal set U but are not in N. Now we look at difference of a set represented as A minus B. Difference between set A and set B represented as A minus B. Simply the set of elements that are in A but are not in B. So if you look at this are uh, the sets of elements in A, A, B, C, D, E, F. And these are the elements in B, B, D, E, G, H. What are the elements that are here but are not here? You see that they are A. A is here, but it's not here. C, C is here, but it's not here. F, F is here, but it's not here. So A minus B is this. But B minus A are the elements that are in B that are not in A. So if you look at A, B, what are the elements here that are not here? We talk about G. There is G here, but there is no G here. We talk about H. There is H here, but there is no H here. But then you can see that A minus B is not the same thing as B minus A. Can you see that? They are not the same. So you have to do it carefully. Please, if you like this, our video, click on the subscribe button, like and share it. Uh, thanks for your uh, subscription and everything. So we'll meet again. Thank you.